So welcome one and all to Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor Joe Sparrow. And hooray, it's the end of year special edition podcast, an extravaganza celebrating the year's best music marketing campaigns. As you know, Music Ally provides an analysis rich guide to the biz and that's what this podcast does too. We're uh, looking at obviously some of the more meaningful things that have happened this year in marketing and this podcast will be brief-ish by comparison uh, and uh, leaning on some information that Music Ally Grand Fromage Paul Brindley mentioned to me recently uh, that in 2016 uh, Kaiser Permanente from San Diego performed 290 high fives in one minute. So uh, let me perform some very real mental arithmetic here. Uh, this podcast should take about the same time as it took him to perform 8,700 high fives. That's about 30 minutes. Now, just yesterday, Music Ally published its hotly anticipated Sandbox Campaigns of the Year issue, which is published every December and rounds up the best, most innovative and interesting campaigns of the previous 12 months. And uh, 2021's issue is the biggest one we've ever had, which says a lot about the quality of all the campaigns that took place last year. Now, there's a link to the report somewhere next to this podcast, and I recommend you clicking on it. It's freely available, and it's an incredibly useful resource for anyone planning music marketing in 2022. Each of the campaigns in the report has detailed overviews of how the campaign was set up, how targets were chosen, and it includes lots of data measuring the success along the way. So, again, a strong recommendation that you uh, have a look and take inspiration for your work in 2022. Anyway, in this podcast, we've invited three of Music Allies' marketing experts, uh, and we've asked each of them to pick out two of the uh, chosen campaigns in the report that they liked the most and to talk around them and explain what they thought was good about them. So uh, we are going to talk shortly to, first of all, Eamon Ford, the music industry journalist who is also Sandbox's editor and editor and compiler of the Marketing Campaigns of the Year list. Uh, and he has also recently published a book called Leaving the Building, the Lucrative Afterlife of Music Estates, which uh, digs into how the music industry ensures that pop stars are lucrative even after they die. Uh, and that is a hint to a couple of the selections that he has chosen. Um, there is a link to his excellent book somewhere around this podcast and again highly recommended. We've also invited Magda Yodrievska, uh, marketing executive at Music Ally and her colleague the ever-dependable Marlon Hulbrock who's Music Ally's head of marketing services. So we got the three of them uh, together on a Zoom call which spanned three different countries and uh, we have asked them to explain their choices. So let's hop over to that call right now. So I've uh, asked the three of you to pick two campaigns each from the Sam Sandbox Campaigns of the Year uh, 2021 uh, edition and I will shortly hear from you all in order. But Eamon, first of all, uh, you are the long-standing slash long-suffering compiler of the Sandbox Campaigns of the Year issue. I am, yes. You've also sifted through the many entrants that we had this year and you've put this together. What, what, um, what are your sort of uh, top-line thoughts about um, this year's Campaigns of the Year issue? Uh, well, well, last year was really uh, a year of people getting their heads around the impact of the pandemic. So there was a lot of campaigns that had to pivot or change direction or try and find a new angle to fill in that, that mainly that massive gap left by live or kind of traditional promo on TV or radio or whatever. But this year it was all very much baked in. It was like these campaigns were like conceived from the office as just go there. We're, we're going to have to just get on with it. This is the reality that we're going to have to deal with. And they just felt a lot less panicked in a way, if I can be crass about it. They didn't feel like uh, they were under the cosh quite as much. I think they, the, it was kind of encouraging to see how quickly people adapted. Once they knew what was in front of them, uh, and they'd had a couple of months to get their heads around it. You could see the kind of the shape and the architecture and the feel of campaigns just naturally kind of shifting into this new dynamic where you go, okay, live streaming is just a part of it. It's not this panic thing that we just do to kind of drive engagement. And there wasn't that desperation to, to put in live streaming just because you felt like you had to have a live presence. It really felt like if they were doing live streaming, it was really there for a considered reason yeah. in the same way that they would do 
an Alexa scale or they would do a TikTok campaign or whatever. It was just, it just, everything kind of batted in as just a part of the new, new normal, I think is how I described it in the intro letter. So I think it was, it was really interesting just how flexible and adaptable the campaigns were. And uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. D- did you feel that it, because people had to uh, sort of had a warning to, to they knew they were going to have to plan differently during the pandemic, um, but had these yeah. restrictions, did, did, did you feel that it made people extra inventive or extra sort of novel, it had some novelty to what they were doing? You you could see that digital was ever more present. Uh, it always was. It was it was a huge part of. It. I, I I kind of spent when I do uh, behind the campaigns. I kind of spent a year joking with uh, marketing people that suddenly artists wanted to speak to them because they had a huge amount of time yeah. in their hands to go actually speak to the marketing team rather than you know, oh you're getting you're getting half an afternoon and I'm going to go off and tour and do TV and do all of the cool stuff and I think that that probably caused a real sea change where artists actually started to see the real benefit of digital A as a way to reach audiences, B as a way to bring in money. And rather than just kind of go, okay, digital is just this thing that we have to do, sometimes under duress, I think they, uh, the, the better artists kind of became much more involved in that, involved in the creative decisions rather than just going, right, okay, I'm here to generate hashtag content for whichever platform that I'm supposed to be promoting this week. So I felt that there was a lot more collaboration between marketing teams and uh, everyone yeah. else. Great. Well, let's dive into uh, your picks. I've asked all three of Eamon, Magda and Marlon to pick uh, two of the uh, finalists in the Sandbox campaigns of the year that they thought were particularly interesting. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to outline which campaign it was, explain why it was effective and maybe suggest what this might help marketing teams learn from it as they start to plan for stuff that's going to happen in 2022 so Eamon let's start with you uh, what's your first choice ah right the first one I'm going to go for is uh, Death Row's uh, 30th anniversary we did this earlier in the years behind the campaign feature so I spoke to uh, uh, the company behind the market and of that. And it was quite interesting because they were doing an anniversary campaign for a label which is not not actually active anymore. So it was kind mm. of, a, it was a legacy campaign, but they obviously couldn't draw on, well, obviously you didn't want to necessarily get Sugnoy involved, uh, but none <laughs> of the orders would have been um, kind of involved because they're not active, they're not on that label anymore. And it was a really interesting way to try and uh, reintroduce the label to new generations of hip hop fans. Obviously you've got Dr. Dre and Snoop and Tupac and kind of incredible names that have kind of been on uh, the death row roster. And they used really interesting approaches uh, to to make the label relevant and make those artists relevant to new fans. And I think the the more interesting part uh, was that they really used NFTs in a really clever way because it was all about, rather than kind of having these uh, incredibly expensive collector's items, there were some of those, but it was very much they would do these regular drops uh, to make it all very accessible. And I thought that was just a really kind of quite clever, egalitarian thing. And then they did like qu- quite fun things. They had a basketball game. They did a collaboration with uh, a burger chain uh, and things like that. So it was just a, a fat burger chain. It, was it, it was fat, classic, it was uh, fat burger yeah. because they had the they had the triple XL burger and yes. obviously three <laughs> X's is thirty years and it all tied in nicely That's and they perfect, did things like they were, yeah they worked with like a, a a a pencil company of all things so they were like they were kind of across a lot of different areas and it was quite it was just a really fun way to to look at an anniversary it was kind of it was reverential towards the past but it was kind of fun it was trying to find new connections with uh contemporary artists uh they kind of created an online museum as well so there's lots and lots of different parts and it was obviously 
they had most of a year to look at this. It was kind of stretched across yeah. um, the whole year. So I just thought as a as an anniversary marketing campaign where you don't actually have access to the founders of the label or any of the artists, I think it did a really good job of going, right, okay, well, this is how we can this is how we can make this interesting and relevant without those fail safes. I mean, you've uh, written a book that was published this year, which was about um, deceased artists and how their catalogue and their estates uh, operate after their death. I mean, here we're talking about a record label that is dead, essentially. It doesn't release anything anymore. But as we look into the the future, we're seeing a lot of people really... um, looking to work with catalogue you know from not necessarily from dead artists but you know, from bands that might be defunct you know and, and they're looking for new ways to reinvigorate yeah. it so do you think this is something which we're going to see a lot more of in in the next coming years yeah and we, you this is a theme that will carry into my second choice which we'll get to in a bit as well which is about archive management and i think this is a really interesting thing and kind of one of my big theses in in the book uh plug plug leaving the building the lucrative afterlife of music estates out now in all good bookshops and ebook retailers etc uh is that you have to mark it as if you're a current artist, so you can't rely on the 10-year, 30-year, 50-year anniversary and just leave it at that. You've got to be active. You've got to kind of feed the algorithms, be that on Spotify yeah. or TikTok or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. So you, you have to have this steady flow of stuff. But the problem is once you get into archives is that there are, only, uh, there are finite recordings and there's only so much you can do with them. And then after a point when you stop when you keep if you keep dropping the bucket down the well you're going to just start pulling up pebbles and dust and spiders rather than nice yeah. tasty water yes well, well we'll discuss that a little bit more in a minute uh, as you said with your second choice and uh Eamon's book is a ripper read folks a high a strong recommendation from me thanks Eamon. it is it's, uh, about, it's, it's, it's about dead people but it's interesting it, it is. Think. Yeah, it, it, it truly is. Uh, so, and we'll chat more about that in a minute. Um, Magda, let's come to you next. Um, who have you uh, chosen for your first pick? Yeah, so for my first pick, um, I've chosen an Australian band called Vacations. And actually, now when I think about it, both of my campaigns are kind of uh, similar in terms of that they both um, include really high fan engagement but a little bit in a different ways. And basically what um, what Vacations did very well is that they, um, actually what Network, their label, did really well, is that they saw um, their single Young, I think it is called, yeah. um, picking up on TikTok. And um, they reacted, basically they reacted really fast. You know, they signed the, um, the band really fast and they started to just, you know, utilizing the platform um, as much as possible. So this is all kind of, um, you know, the whole campaign kind of um, was created about the user generated content. So not only um, TikTok, not only they did influencer campaigns on TikTok, not only they optimized TikTok to, you know, um, name the song and the band correctly so people knew what song was that, but they took it a step further and they created a fan sourced music video from, um, from, you know, the videos that people send or created to the song. And they also did um, a competition for recreating the stems to the song um, mm. because the band has lost the stems, which I find hilarious. And this, you know, just proves that you can make a marketing activity from any situation. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. um, just to sum up, I just think um, that they really, you know, took the idea of user generated content and um, content that their their fans created and you know really highlighting the opportunities right here and also i could see that they said um in the campaign overview that you know because of the australian lockdowns they were feeling really isolated um and they can't wait for the tour so i just think you know it's it's an incredible incredible way to kind of build your digital presence and build a community around you without um, the possibility of connecting in real um, real life. Yeah, a great example of capitalising on something which had happened on its own. And, exactly. you know, um, 
when we look again looking ahead this was like you said it was a fun activation it got the fans involved and this is something which is really important isn't it at the moment that artists are looking to uh, really have a direct connection with their fans and do, do you think uh, same sort of question really do you think that this is again something we're going to see more of in in the next few years I mean, I hope so, honestly, because um, I feel like people want to be more and more involved um, into the process, not only into, um, you know, the process of marketing music, but into the process of creation. And as we see, we can see, you know, fun created music videos and um, things like that. So um, I really hope so. I really think people yeah. want, want that and people will get engaged if they, you know, have opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks. Well, we'll come to your second choice in a minute. But uh, last, but by no means least, uh, Marlon, what, what was your first choice? Yes. Uh, so one of my two choices was the Nothing But Thieves campaign by RCA. Um, so that was a campaign in between two parts of an EP. So kind of bridging from the first part to the second part. Um, and there were a couple of things that I found really interesting. So it started with the, the band teasing out the first single of the second part. And I think they used their content pieces in a very clever way because they posted clips on social media that um, one frame at a time had hidden codes that fans could only um, see if they took screenshots of the, of the pieces of content. Um, and then using these screenshots, they could kind of piece together the track title and date. Um, and I think that in itself is a very clever way of kind of playing or using the algorithm in a good way, because obviously fans had to watch the piece of content maybe a couple of times to actually realize what was going on and be able to screenshot at the right time. And by doing that, they were spending more time on the pieces of content, you know, all of these signals that platforms like Instagram look at. So I think that was a very, very clever way to do. And also they kind of posted this content um, onto different platforms. So if you only were following on one platform, you couldn't get the whole picture. Um, so that was also quite a good way to kind of encourage fans to go to the different platforms, maybe follow on all of the different platforms and a kind of good organic strategy to do that. Um, and they then eventually used um, these content pieces and pieced them together to longer three to five minute pieces of content that they dropped weekly. I don't know how many they dropped, um, but they dropped a couple of them on a weekly basis, uh, but placed behind a pre-save wall. And um, I like that because obviously pre-saves have been around for a long time now, um, but I think giving a good incentive to pre-save and not only promoting it once, but giving you know renewed incentives to pre-save um, is a great idea. And doing that by you know asking the fans to pre-save repeatedly to be able to see all of these pieces of content um, I think was a very well thought through strategy. Do you think um, th this is something we see quite a lot now for instance you play it's an online game it connects your Spotify account and while you're playing it streams the song two or three times which is obviously has an appeal for the bands because okay. it's income and blah 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 do, do you think that fans are happy with this do you think they, they feel a bit sort of like they're being taken advantage of or gamed or are maybe they just happy to do this internet's gone maybe she's got i think that as long as you really make sure that the activation whatever it may be has value to them then it's good i think what what can be quite turn offish is when you we land go. on a website or whatever and you can really see okay there hasn't been much thought put into this and you can really see through all they want me to do is pre-save or connect with Spotify, yeah. but there's not much in, in it for me. But if there's something that's truly fun and a nice experience, then I think fans are more than happy to do that. What I also liked was that they um, were kind of utilizing their mailing list and moving people that were already subscribed there to Discord. Um, so making a Discord mm -hmm. channel password protected. And I think that's a very clever way as well to just make sure that um, you know, not everyone reads email, but email is obviously very, still very important. But just making sure that they're covering different bases and being able to, to engage with their super fans, both on a more traditional platform like email, but also on more emerging platforms um, like Discord. And yeah, besides that, there were lots of other very uh, cool activations, um, digital scavenger hunt stuff, 
Um, I don't know if I can go through all of this now, but overall, I thought it was a very, um, very, very interesting campaign. Yeah, very multifaceted and, and, and uh, really well done. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, thank you, Marlon. So I'm just going to jump in here and say if you're finding this kind of thing useful and you want more of Music Ally's in-depth news and trusted instant analysis waiting for you in your inbox every morning, head on over to musically.com slash subscribe. If you're uh, an indie label, an artist manager, an employee of a CMO or a publisher, you may be eligible for one of our sponsored complimentary subscriptions too. So go and check it out. Anyway, let's go back to our conversation with Eamon, Magda and Marlon. Uh, so uh, let's jump back to the start. Uh, Eamon, you, you sort of teased us earlier saying that the, the second one you've chosen is uh, building on the first and connected with what you have written about recently. So uh, who is it and what is it? Well, uh, personal disclaimer, uh, Def Leppard were the first band I ever saw live. Kings Hall, Belfast, 1987 on the Hysteria Tour. Amazing. Wow. So what they'd done was they kind of realised that under lockdown that they had nothing to do. So they started going through all of their stuff and then they went, we could do something here. So they worked with a company called Invenium who do really interesting stuff with archives. They'll go, they'll do a complete audit of your archive and they'll kind of tag every little thing. So it, it becomes this kind of living resource to use. And what they did was they kind of, they opened it up to uh, the public and most of it is available for free. You've obviously got people like Neil Young who charge for access to his archive and they kind of, they dug through tour passes and, and, tickets and uh, tour diaries and all manner of stuff so if you're a fan you, you basically got this kind of access to 44 years of kind of this this band as they kind of came from uh these kind of wannabes in Sheffield to uh, this, this kind of enormous rock band to this kind of enduring uh band and it was just a really interesting use of archive a really interesting use of fan engagement they would do regular q a's would write little special bits for it they had things like a 40th anniversary thing for high and dry uh which was kind of their uh, second album just as it, as they were starting to break through they had a whole thing with ross helfen who was kind of their unofficial official photographer so they had like a whole thing with him and it was just this really a great way for fans to get to see all of the stuff that is behind all of the stuff that they like. And I think you'll, you'll see a lot more bands and artists realising the importance of their archive and their importance of getting their archives in order. And lockdown was obviously the catalyst for a lot of this, but I think what Def Leppard have done basically turned this, they, I think they called it the first online rock and roll museum was their kind of tagline for the whole yeah. thing. But I think it's it was just a really good use of the past to kind of use that as a hook for kind of existing fans, maybe pull in future fans. And, you know, like certain artists uh, are really, really good with their archive. Like someone like Paul McCartney's got two full-time archivists working at MPL all the time, just kind of pulling everything together. And you can see that in his social media where he can kind of just draw on stuff and just like make these posts that are super relevant and timely. And I think that lots of artists, and this was the thing that I find in the book, is that artists tend to hate looking backwards, which is why loads of them don't make wheels as well, because they don't like to think of life without them in it. And they don't like to dwell too much in the past. And I think they're now becoming awake to the, the kind of the fan appeal of uh, archives, but also there is, there is a kind of potential commercialization of this. They can charge for certain bits. They can have a kind of a premium tier, but also it feeds marketing. If you've got all of your archive in order, if you've got this stuff, so then when it comes to a 40th anniversary, you can go, here's all of this stuff, but also you can just go, here's something that happened on this day in 1988 yeah. it might not be the most significant thing but here is a thing that happened on this day and you've just got this you've got this incredible diary of the past that you can use to kind of define your social media output or whatever else so i think we're going to see a lot more of that i think uh, the obviously the pandemic caused a lot of people to take stock of a lot of stuff but i think rather than just seeing it as something crass to completely commercialise it, it can just become another fan incentive. And I really, really liked the way that they did this. It was just 
it was old we, we use this term a lot in marketing about kind of fan first and stuff like that and a lot of that is kind of lip service and it's not really about the fans but this genuinely was the fans were like at the absolute center of this and they just dug out all of the stuff if you're a fan they dug out everything that you want to yeah. see and i just think it's a it's a kind of best in show example of what you can do with an archive and how you can translate that into the digital world. So I'm, 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 I'm pro leopard yes. on that. They did a good <laughs> job. Uh, in, of course. And, uh, you know, we're seeing as well, obviously, catalogue is, is rocketing in value for all sorts of external reasons at the moment. But um, yeah. as we look at, you know, the streaming becoming is obviously the dominant form of music consumption and a Def Leppard song um, from uh, 1985 has exactly the same weight and authority as a, a modern song in the same genre in that sense because they're competing on an equal footing now. So it's yeah. almost as if this contextualization of, of their archive past is essential to keep continue bringing the value to, to their music from the past to audiences. Oh, today. completely, completely. And it, yeah, and it's, a, it's another little trigger because they could go, okay, it's 35 years since this single came out. And then that will drive people to stream that particular track. Or they'll go, this was the B-side, you might not have heard it. Or this was the Japanese only single that was released in 1980 or whatever, go and play that. So it's always, they're always kind of driving. So, and it was just done in a really nice way where it was never a sales message. It was just going, here's some nice yeah. stuff because uh, by all accounts, they are lovely fellas and that translated into what they did with the archive, which was just going, here's some stuff, help yourselves. And there's a lot there. They, they put a lot of effort into it, it, just in terms of all the different sections they have and the range of stuff that they put up there. So I think lots of artists should really be looking at what they did. And, and a, a lot of the kudos has to go to Invanium because they are really really good at this kind of stuff there i know that they're working with a lot of other big artists that they don't they can't talk about for nda reasons but several of them you will know right okay well it's something to watch out for then uh yeah yeah i i think you'll see a lot more of that i think artists are, are probably more at peace with their past now than they ever were because they realize the importance mm -hmm. of it. well uh yeah you're right it felt really authentic and it felt the sort of thing that fans are, fans are going to really, really yes. love. So thank you, Eamon, for pouring some sugar on the uh, Def Leppard vault. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, you animal. <laughs> and on that terrible uh, pun, let's move over to Magda again. Hi, Magda. Um, so you, you mentioned that your first pick was sort of playful and fun. What, what is the second one? So the second one um, also includes kind of fun, a lot of fun activations and fun engagement. But as um, I feel like the first one was focused on the user generated content. The second one is focused on creating content and feeding people constantly with, you know, um, engaging activations. So I chose a campaign by Greta Van Fleet uh, from Republic Records. And basically, um, you know, they were transitioning from the like kind of the first album era to the second one, uh, or the next one. I'm not actually sure if that's the second one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they were transitioning between you know music eras, and they um, what they did was they started um, kind of feeding um, fans with content at the beginning of the year. Um, when the main activations actually started during like April, May, and the actual campaign started kind of later in the spring, which is, I think, really a really smart way to, you know, just not let people forget about you. Um, but also, you know, keep people engaged and actually keep feed people with um, new content and keep them, you know, um, keep them around your accounts. And then when it um, comes to the actual um, campaign, they did a couple activations um, across different social channels. So they used, um, you know, they used the Spotify tool that um, would also um, kind of tell fans how much of the catalog they streamed. So you log in with your Spotify account and then you see how much of the catalog have you streamed and how ready you are for the new album, which I think is a great idea for, you know, catalog consumption and just building the hype for the new album. Uh, so that's from the DSP side. And then from the social side, they did an interactive AR filter on Instagram and Facebook. They did a Snapchat lens. They did, you know, a Reddit Q&A. They did a live um, listening party as well. 
Um, so they constantly provided um, kind of ways for fans to engage in the conversation. Um, and, you know, once they released an album, they um, also their website was full of like never before seen art and photos and kind of personal notes from the band behind the scenes commentary. So um, basically the whole kind of um, process, uh, basically they were describing, you know, the whole process and they kept their fans engaged and, you know, able to ask questions and able to hold the conversation. So again, I think, you know, this is a really, really smart way to um, go from the pre pre-release, which is, you know, start early and kind of don't just disappear between albums, but, you know, try to stay on social media until, you know, driving fan engagement throughout the whole campaign. This is a, a good campaign because it has so many different elements. It's very, it's very sort of comprehensive. But of course, Greta yes. Van Fleet is not, they don't have a huge budget. They, you know, they, they're trying to make things work as best they can with what they have. But they're, they're managing to, to provide, you know, like you say, an a AR filter, that all these, uh, these interactive elements that are really engaging for fans. Do you think, I mean, one of the things we're reporting on a lot at Music Ally is the fact that artists now are looking ahead and saying right okay we we want to go direct to fan we want to connect with them in innovative ways and we're using all these platforms that perhaps in the past we would have not had time or to use or perhaps weren't fully functional but now they are and suddenly we're seeing artists able to access these things through lots of different uh, easy to use platforms is this is this what we're going to see? I mean, in the past, a campaign like you've just described would have been really difficult to put together. Do yeah. you think now it's getting easier for artists and teams to build these quite nuanced and comprehensive campaigns like this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, the AR filter or live listening party or Reddit Q&A, these are all activations that are very easy to create and very easy to recreate DIY. So, you know, I don't see a reason why um, a kind of DIY band or artist wouldn't um, provide at least kind of a few of similar activations, you know. So, yeah, definitely, I think it is very possible for artists from, you know, different levels to recreate or kind of create a similar campaign. I think it all goes down to um, to the content and to, you know, having a lot of content, filming a lot of videos, taking a lot of pictures, yeah. maybe creating, you know, an AR filter or live chat or Reddit Q&A. But I think it all comes down to the content and how much the artist wants to engage with the fan. And so, and so it sort of sounds like it's, it's it, it, planning is more important than ever. Building this, Eamon was yeah. talking about look, looking backwards into an archive, but artists now can look to build an archive for the future, for all these future things as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, great. Thanks, Magda. Two really great examples. And uh, yeah, thanks for picking those. Good stuff. Uh, Marlon, I hate to leave you last, uh, but it happens happens a lot, doesn't it? It's not deliberate, I promise. Marlon, tell us your, your second pick, please. Yes, so my second pick is a campaign for iDress, an artist that's on Lex Records. And um, this was a campaign that... So basically, they were preparing to release a new album. Um, this was before the pandemic started, then obviously that didn't happen. So during the pandemic, um, they then focused on kind of really building the socials and creating authentic content to the artist, um, amongst others on TikTok. And then in late 2020, they actually saw one of his singles called Jealous going viral on TikTok. Um, they then quickly rolled out a digital marketing campaign, which is one of the things that I like, that they were really reactive to it and that they would see, okay, digital marketing actually works best when it's amplifying something that's already there rather than, you know, working something from nothing um, and trying to really help the, the discovery of the track on streaming services. So trying to translate what was happening on TikTok to streaming services um, and also using that, the, all of, this advertising to build um, retargeting lists on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which were then used for the upcoming album campaign. Um, what I also liked was that they were really trying to not just make this a TikTok moment, but um, then, you know, in preparation of the album release, they did lots of different activations to showcase this is actually, you know, a serious artist 
the people that were discovering him through TikTok should be interested in him. So they created eight different music videos. Um, they did more digital advertising. They were really looking into what kind of tracks were gaining traction and being receptive to that. So focusing on advertising those tracks that were you know, the most reactive and then also hiring promo teams in several of his key territories that were reacting the most. So really seeing, looking into the data and, and utilizing that and, and uh, supporting that. Um, and I think what was quite interesting as well was that um, they really highlighted the fact that they didn't want to focus on these kind of short term vanity metrics, but really trying to use what they were doing with their digital advertising around TikTok to bring fans in to the world of the artist and trying to really engage them. So for example, what they did was they used the snippets for their digital advertising um, of songs, song parts that were going viral. So creating this recognition um, and targeting that to the kind of trends from TikTok on YouTube. Um, so really targeting the people that would know the song, but then also retargeting those people with um, subsequent videos. So using that TikTok moment, but then hitting them again and again with other tracks of the artist to try and really um, build a fan base. And I think um, that is a very, very smart thing to do to, to use such a moment to try and build actual fans. Again, an interesting example. I think this is the second one we've had of a, uh, an artist having something happen naturally on a social media platform and then the artist then reacting to it and and maximizing that potential that's hard to plan for right you could you you the virality you can't push it you know do you think that it's going to be you know you, there's so many platforms now that are designed for virality tiktok famously so but almost every platform now is is designed to maximize your creative moments do, do you think that this is something that teams are going to sort of plan for which is to say okay we're going to we're going to have this campaign we're going to try and push things out in the traditional way but we're going to design some things which we kind of hope will go viral but if they don't it doesn't matter but if it, if they do we've designed something to take advantage of it yeah i guess so i mean i think it's it's just about knowing how to react and and actually paying attention and once something happens to to react quickly and make sure to kind of strategize around it which i think the team here has done really well um with seeing the bigger picture and i think that you know there, there are lots of kind of artists or teams who who think oh if, if a song goes viral on tiktok then that's it that's perfect we're sorted but actually the work starts after that i would say and i would argue to as i said kind of try to to have that cross over to other platforms and build fans and not just have a viral moment and i think that was particularly strong in this campaign um and yeah and you said you know you said that you can't plan for that and that's obviously true i haven't really looked into the content they were posting before actually two of his songs went viral or like had a viral moment um but i think with a dedicated strategy on these sort of platforms you can at least work towards some sort of virality obviously not every song will go viral but if you if you really spend time and and um, and dedicate a strategy to the platform, you can at least make it more likely that a song will gain some traction. Um, but yeah, it's, I think any sort of marketing plan should have um, the flexibility and contingency plan in place. If something happens, something unexpected happens, how are we going to react to it? To answer your question. Yeah. Wise, <laughs> wise words. Yes, very comprehensively. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, really good. And uh, we will, of course, um, put links to all of these uh, campaign examples, as well as a link, of course, to the Sandbox Campaign of the Year issue uh, somewhere around this podcast. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you for your insight, Magda, Eamon and Marlon. Thanks for joining me. And that's that. Huge thanks to Eamon, Magda and Marlon uh, for sharing their insight. And uh, once again, all of the uh, campaigns that they mentioned, plus the other 62 or so that are in the report, um, are available in the report freely for you. And the link is next to this podcast. So uh, some reading for you over Christmas there to uh, inspire you for the new year. Uh, truly uh, uh, the best year and the biggest year we've ever had in the marketing campaigns of the year report so uh, plenty to learn from and be inspired by 
So if you found that useful, uh, please share this podcast on with someone else who you think will get something good out of it. And if you found it uh, controversial or have any feedback whatsoever, please email me and vent your spleen. It's joe at musically.com. That's joe at musically.com. We also have uh, a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up uh, a soupçon of the best analysis, news, marketing insight and skills that Music Ally has on offer. So sign up and make it your New Year's resolution to become a truly a better person. Uh, and uh, links are in the description, as always. Um, and, uh, well, that's it from me. So uh, this is probably the last podcast of 2021. We will return in the new year, hopefully heralding the uh, grand return of our flaxen head hero, Stuart Dredge, uh, the uh, Music Allies Head of Insight. Uh, but until then, have a great Christmas, have a great New Year and holiday period, and uh, hopefully see you in the New Year relaxed and ready to go. Uh, that's it from me, Joe Sparrow. Until next time, farewell.